God has bigger plans for your life than you have for your own life. And all he is waiting for is for you to understand your purpose. And then the plans will come to pass. Because God has one purpose in this world. That is to seek and to save those who are lost. And to establish his kingdom in this world. And if our purpose is the same as God's purpose, then God will do marvelous things through our life. And in the process, we will be blessed. Just like the child who submitted his five loaves and two fishes, he thought by giving it to God's service, he would lose it. But by giving it away, he ended up with more than he started with and everyone else was filled. That is what God wants to do with your life. God already knows what you need. And God knows what those around you need also. And if you commit yourself to fulfilling the needs of those around you, your needs will also be met. Amen. Because the same God who loves them loves you. I have two children. And if one of my children is hungry and says, can you can you give my sister some food? I will give enough to the child for herself and her sister. I'll say, on your way to your sister, you can have some as well, because I love both of you. So the way to prosper is to look for the needs of others and how you can fulfill them. And the God who loves them will bless you for so doing. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. I'll read verse 33 first, and then I will go back and read from verse 31. So Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Many of you will recognize it when I begin to read. It says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now I will go back to 31, so we'll know what these things are that Jesus was talking about. Verse 31 of Matthew chapter 6. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Today I'm going to talk about three words. The competition, the challenge, and the commitment, the competition, the challenge, and the commitment. When God speaks into our lives and says, I want to use you and bless you, there are conditions to that word. And the condition number one is, but I must be your only God. You must not have any other gods except me. I don't want you to be serving me and serving other gods at the same time. So if you're going to work for me, work for me alone. Because there are many things in this life that compete for our, our attention and our highest affection. And God says, I can only use those for whom I am their highest priority. And if I am your highest priority, God says, all the other things that you need, I will make sure that you have them. So let's break it down. If your highest priority is education, then God cannot use you. 
But if your highest priority is the kingdom of God, God will give you the education that you need. If your highest priority is money, God cannot use you. But if your highest priority is the kingdom of God, God will give you the money that you need. If your highest priority is your career, then God cannot use you. But if your highest priority is the kingdom of God, God will place you in the career where you need to be. But you must put God first and have no other gods but the true God. Exodus chapter 20 verse 3 says, Thou shalt have no other gods but me. No other gods but me. And the wonderful thing about that is that you, ha you need no other gods but me. Because I can provide everything that you need. I remember my, my daughter said to me the other day that she went to a party. And somebody at the party who she didn't know offered to pay for her, her food because it was one of these parties where you go to this restaurant and you buy the food. She already had money, and the, this person offered to pay for the money, for the food. So she declined and said, no, thank you, I'm okay. And I said to her later on, and we were discussing, she said, I don't need their money because I've got a dad. Once you have the father, you have all that you need. You all have a dad. Your dad says, if you serve me, I'll give you whatever you need. Every month when I do my budget, the first thing I make sure is that my daughter at university has enough money. And then we will sort out with what is left. Because she is my child. That's what God says for you. If you're doing what God wants you to do, he will make sure you have everything you need. But make sure that there are no other gods but the true God. Don't let anything in this world compete for your highest affection except God alone. And what kind of God is this? This is a God who desires above everything to give you what you need. Those of you who are parents know what I'm talking about. It gives you pleasure and happiness to fulfill the needs of your children, providing that you agree with those needs and your children are doing good things. Then it pleases you to give to them. If I had my last plate of food and my children were hungry, I would be happy to give it to them, happier than eating it myself because I love them. That's the kind of God we serve. That's the kind of God who says, don't worry about the future. I've got your back. I have got it covered. Just do what I tell you, and I will make sure that all these things that you need, the food, the shelter, the fees, the career, the good health, everything, I will make sure that you have it. Let's explore what kind of God we're talking about here. Matthew chapter 7, beginning from verse 7. Matthew chapter 7 beginning from verse 7. Because the only reason God wants you to serve him is so that through you, God can bless others and God can bless you at the same time. Matthew chapter 7, beginning at verse 7. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh, receiveth, and he that seeketh, findeth, and to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom, if his son ask bread, will give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? So what God is saying is, I love you more than the best parent among you could possibly love your own children. I love you more than that. 
So don't doubt for one moment that your needs are going to go unmet if you give God the first of your life. Because God says, I guarantee you, if you put me first, I will sort you out. And I will bless you beyond your own expectations. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 33. Ephesians chapter 6. Sorry, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. This is just one short verse that should open your mind to the unlimited potential that God wants to place in you. It says now, well, let me start at verse 19. Ephesians 3, verse 19. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye may be filled with all the fullness of God. And when you're filled with all the fullness of God, this is what will happen. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. So God says, if you put my kingdom first, I will come inside of you and I will fulfill your ambitions beyond your own dreams. Because my dreams for you are bigger than your ambitions for yourself. But first, I must be the Lord of your life. All these things will be added. But the competition is fierce. You see, there is competition for your time. But God says, give me the first of your time. When you wake up in the morning, the competition begins already. As soon as you look at your watch, the competition starts. Competing for your time. Got to get to work. Got to sort the children out. Got to get them to school. Got to get breakfast ready. Got to do this. Got to answer my emails. Got to check my WhatsApp. Got to do all kinds of things. No time for prayer. No time for God. And it's almost as if saying, Lord, I'd like to talk to you, and I'd like to spend time with you, but you know I'm too busy, so I'll, I'll fit you in at the end of the day. And the end of the day comes, and we kneel down, and we put our heads on our mattresses, and we say, Our Father, and before we get to who art in heaven, it's morning, <laughs> and we're still on our knees. And we think, what happened there? But God says, you missed something today. Do you remember the story of the boy who brought his, his loaves and his fishes? By giving what he had, he ended up with more left over. It is a false economy to say, I have so many things to do today that I don't have time for God. Well, you won't get them done. But if you put God first, give him your first time in the morning, then God will add wisdom and understanding to your life so that with the time that remains, you will accomplish more than you expected to accomplish in that day. When students wake up in the morning and the deadline for their essays is due and God says, give me time. And they say, sorry, Lord, I've got words to write. I've got to start typing. God says, no, give me your first time. He said, but God, if I give you my first time, there won't be enough time left. And God says, remember the loaves and the fishes. If you give me what you have, what is left will go so much further. I will add wisdom and understanding to your mind that you will write down much more than you would have written before, and it will be wise. But you have to trust me. There is competition for your money. God says, support my work. And you say, Lord, but I need to change my car. You know it's old. Lord, I want to decorate my house. Lord, I haven't been on a decent holiday for a long time. And God says, I know that you need all these things. I know that. But, and if you seek my kingdom first, all these things will be added. You will get what you need. But you have to trust me. And you will see what I will do. There is competition for your skills and your abilities. God says, I want you to serve me. 
I want you to help other people to get to know me. I want you to give your life in service for me. And we say, Lord, I'd love to, but you know, I'm, I'm trained to do this particular job. And, and when I do it, they pay me well. And I've trained for this, this purpose, and I need the money. And God says, if you give your skills to serve me, all these things, you will get them. They will be added. So often the gods that compete in this competition for our lives are good things. Our children are a blessing from the Lord. But sometimes we spend so much time focusing on those children that we don't take time for ourselves. Sometimes before the children were born, we would spend time in the Word feeding our own souls. And when the children come, we, we feed them. And we stop feeding ourselves. Have you ever found that? You teach your children their lesson study and you go through their quarterlies with them and you let them memorize their little verses. And by the time you finish, you've got no time left to seek the Lord for yourself. And then the problem happens is your faith becomes more and more meaningless as you try and pass it on to those children. Because while you are teaching them, you are not feeding yourself. Don't let even your children become your God. Yes, you are responsible for them, but God is the first in your life. That's the competition. But God says, start the competition by surrender. And if you surrender to me, I will make sure that you don't end up behind. In fact, you will end up ahead. I remember when my wife was working really hard to get a new job in the school where she was. It was very difficult to get promotion. So I said to her, well, you need, if you want to assistant head and headships of big schools, go outside of your, your city and apply widely. And she did, and she got a, a series of interviews. And every interview was a whole day. And she had four of them, four days of interviews from morning until night, presentations and assemblies and discussions and panels and written documents and presentations and PowerPoints. and All day long it was going, teach a class and we'll observe you, solve this problem and we'll discuss how it's going to work. And so it went on. And every morning she got up with this huge, unknown, complex day ahead of her. But still we put God first. Instead of rushing to the documents that she had to revise for her interview, we knelt down and we prayed. Because we believe if we seek God first, all the things that we need, God will add them. And you know, it's better when God adds it, because then you don't get proud and boastful. You don't say, look what I have done. You say, look what the Lord has done. And so when we had finished our time in prayer, <clears throat> she went off for her days of interviews. And the numbers kept going down. At the end of the first day, she said, Six of them have been sent home, and I'm still in. I said, good. We continued. Look at your documents, revise, take a good sleep. In the morning, let us seek the Lord. And we spent time in prayer. Even though the temptation was to rush to the documents, let's spend time with the Lord. Because if this job is for you, it's the Lord who is going to give it to you and not yourself. And then she went for a second day of interviews, and she came back and said, five more people were sent home, but I'm still in. Good. Third day came. The pressure was building now because they were down to the last three. I said, well, seek the Lord. If it is for you, then the Lord will give it to you. At the end of the third day, she said, no one has been sent home. The three of us are still in, and tomorrow they're going to decide. I said, okay. Next day, the nerves were even higher, and I said, let's seek the Lord. If it is for you, the Lord is the one who will give it to you. If it is not, God has something better because he said, if you seek me first, all these things that pertain to your food and your income and your money and your shelter and your clothes, I'll make sure that you've got them. Now, at the end of the fourth day, she returned home and I said, what is the news? She said, I don't know yet. I'm waiting for a phone call. And so we waited and we waited and we waited. And then in the evening, just before we were going to go to sleep, 
a phone call came. It was the head teacher. And she began the sentence by saying, I am happy to inform you. And my, my Lydia, my daughter, and, and myself were in the background dancing. Yes! <laughs> Quietly, so as not to disturb the telephone call. <laughs> but we were praising God. Because it was God who did this. And when God does what he does, it creates a better sense of security than when you think you have done it. Because if you have got your job by your own skill, then you have to use your own skill to keep that job. But if God has given you the job because you're faithful to him, you just have to continue being faithful to him because he is the one that gave you the job. So whatever you're going through in life, put God first. And the things that you are trying to get, you'll get them. And more than you were expecting to receive. So when there is competition for your time, give God your first time. Amen. When there's competition for your money, give God your first money. When there's competition for your skills, give God the benefit of your first skills. And when other things try and take your affection, remember that it was God who gave them to you and give God the glory. But we know this. We understand this already. And this is not the first time we have read that we should seek God's kingdom first and all these things should be added. We all have heard these things before. But here comes the challenge. The challenge is, Will you actually do this? It's easy to say, I agree, we should give God the first of our time. But when you wake up in the morning and you are nervous because of the big schedule that you have, the question is, am I going to actually do this? Because it is only by putting it into action that you actually receive the benefit. And it's interesting, you know, we talk about the story of the five loaves and the two fishes. But there was another parable, another miracle, very similar to that, that we talk about less. And that was with the seven loaves. Let's read that one also. So the children's story was taken from Matthew chapter 14, which was feeding the 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes, the 5,000 men plus women and children. But let's look at now Matthew chapter 15, Verse 32. Matthew chapter 15, beginning at verse 32. Matthew 15, verse 32 onwards. Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I will not send them away fasting, lest they faint in the way. And his disciples say unto him, Whence shall we have such bread in the wilderness as to fill so great a multitude? And Jesus said unto them, How many loaves have ye? And they say, Seven and a few fishes. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. And he took seven loaves and the fishes and gave thanks and break them and gave to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up of the broken meat that was left over seven baskets full. And they that did eat were 4,000 men, besides women and children. So those who were not there when the 5,000 were fed with five loaves and two fishes would have heard when the 4,000 were fed with seven loaves and a few fishes. Because Jesus wanted them to know, when you follow me, I will fulfill your needs. I will take responsibility for your needs. It's very much like how the companies work. 
You know, when you work for a big company, suppose you work for a company that requires you to travel all over the country, then they will take responsibility for providing you with a car because you need that car to do their work. If you need any uniform to do their work, they will provide you the uniform because you need it to do their work. If you need expenses to travel back and forth, they will give you the expenses because you need it to do their work. And they will continue to fund your life as long as you're doing their work. But if you stop doing their work, they'll want the car back and the expenses will stop and everything will stop because you're no longer doing their work. Suppose you work for British Telecom and they gave you a van and you enjoyed the van and they said, well, on the weekends you can drive the van for your own purposes, make sure you are ready for work on Monday morning. And suppose you decided, I don't want to work for British Telecom anymore, I want to be a taxi driver and I want to use this van to do taxiing. They'll say, no, no, no. This van comes with a purpose. As long as you're fulfilling our purpose, these things will be given to you. It is the same with God. God has a purpose for our lives. And the purpose is simple, to join him in seeking and saving those who are lost. And as long as we have his purpose, he will make sure we have all that we need to do his work. It is so simple as that. And Jesus makes it clear that material things are his responsibility when you are doing his work. And to make that clear, he spoke to his disciples, and he, he referred them, he said, don't you remember when they were losing their faith? Don't you remember when I fed those people? Mark chapter 8, verse 19, is a wonderful summary of those two, those two miracles. And I, I made sure that you read both of them so that you would understand the conversation in Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, verse 19 and 20. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Mark chapter 8, verse 19, 20, and 21. And he says, Jesus said, When I break the five loaves among the 5,000, how many baskets fragments did they take up? They said unto him, Twelve. And when the seven among the 4,000, and the seven among the 4,000, how many baskets of fragments did they take up? They said, Seven. And he said unto them, How is it then that you do not understand? What Jesus was making the point of, he says, Don't you remember that every time somebody dedicates their life to me, they end up with more than they had before? They started off with a few fish, they ended up with 12 baskets. They started off with seven loaves, they ended up with seven baskets full. Don't you understand? That's how I want to bless you, by Willingly receiving what you have for my service and rewarding you for your faithfulness. Because every time God does a miracle, there was more left over than was at the beginning. And yet, everything was fulfilled. God wants you to put him first in the competition. The competition for your time, the competition for your money, the competition for your skill and the competition among all the other things that take your affection. And then God wants to challenge you to say, will you actually do this? Not just say, I agree, it's true, but will you do it? Because unless you do it, you will not reap the benefits. Imagine if, if the child or the person who had the five loaves and fishes said, Jesus, I believe that you can do miracles with these, this food. I believe that you can... Feed everybody with it. But I don't want to give it to you. Can you just feed them with it, but leave it in my hand? God says, no, first you've got to let it go. Be prepared to lose it in my hand, and trust me that I will put it back. So there is a theory, and there is the practice. The theory is understanding what God will do. The practice is actually doing it. Because it is only by doing it that you will discover that it works. A young lady came to me who was planning to get baptized. But she had one problem. And the problem was tithe. 
She said, can I, can I be baptized without this tithe thing? You know, I think 10% is a bit much. It's, it's, a, it's a very expensive tax. You know, for her, tithe was, was a tax, like, like the subs that you pay to, to join a club, you know, the subscriptions. And, and there are no clubs out there that take 10% of your income as a subscription. So your church is quite expensive. And I said to her, it has nothing to do with that. It is a completely different thing, what tithe is. I said, tithe is a faith journey. And God wants you to prove him. She said, well, how do I prove him? I said, do this. I said, at the end of the month, how much money do you normally have left over? And she said, well, that's easy. I have none. I said, good. I said, at the beginning of next month, take 10% of your income, put it in an envelope, and put it on a shelf, and don't touch it. And see if you get through the month as well as you did before. If you make it to the end of the month, then return your tithe to God. If you run out of money and start starving before the end of the month, go back to that shelf and take the money back. Because it's up to God to prove himself to you. It's up to you. You can do it. So the next month, she took 10% of her income, put it in cash, put it in an envelope, and put it on the shelf in her house. And said, right, I'm going to see if I manage till the end of the month with the money that's left. At the end of the month, she phoned me. Said, Pastor. I said, yes. Guess what? This is the first month that I had money left over at the end of the month. And I said, where is that envelope? She said, it's still on the shelf. I said, return it to God and do the same next month. The next month she did the same, and she called me again. And the phone call was the same as the time before. And I said, well, based upon how God has proved himself to you, you choose whether or not you want to follow him in this way. And she said, well, God has proved himself, so I will follow him. And that's what God says. Prove me now saith the Lord, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. So do it. If you wake up in the morning and it is your custom to rush into the day because you're too busy to pray, starting from tomorrow morning, do it and see what happens. Take some time out for God. Switch your phone off so nobody can disturb you during that time and give God the first hour of your day. And see if you get everything done with the time that is left. If you do, the next day do it again. And God will prove himself to you. And then try that with every aspect of your life. That is the challenge. So now you understand the competition. Now you have the challenge. And finally is the commitment. Who will commit to proving God in their life. As Joshua stood up before Israel, he said to them simply, Choose you this day who you will serve, whether the gods of the Amorites, who served the wood and the stone and the gold and the silver because that was their security, or will you serve the true God? But as for me and my house, God will always be first in our life. My appeal to you today is to make a commitment to take this challenge, that every aspect of your life will be first surrendered to God, and then you will see how God will bless you. If it is your desire to commit to this challenge, then stand right now where you are, and I will pray to confirm this commitment. Loving Heavenly Father, you see our minds, you hear our hearts, and you know our intentions. Today, Lord, as never before, we want to take up the challenge to put you first in every aspect of our life so that we will enable you 
to fulfill the promise of adding to us everything that we need. So today, Lord, we stand in commitment to you. We are committed to taking up that challenge on a daily basis. And as you reveal more and more to us about aspects of our life that have not been yet surrendered, we will also surrender those to you and put you first in those areas of our life, knowing that everything we give to you, we receive back more from you than we have ever given because you are the God that delights in giving more than the best parent wants to give good gifts to their children. So seal our decision this day. In Jesus' name, amen.